perseverance allows me to love the Lord my God with everything that I am. Yes, sir. To put him first and not anything else. Amen? Right. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. He's saying, get dressed in tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another. Good morning, Mount Moriah. It is my pleasure to welcome you back into the sanctuary on second Sunday of June 2021. Psalm 5 tells us, I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down towards your holy temple in fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. And it is because of that I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord this morning. Amen, amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Oh, Lord, I need thee, as the songwriter says. Amen. Every hour. Every hour, yes, sir. Today's reading comes, the scripture comes from the fifth chapter of Ephesians, verses 21 through 33. And I will be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, so it may be a little bit different than what's up on the board there. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husband, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. To make her holy, cleaning her, with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So no one hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. Since we are members of the body, for this reason, man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The ministry is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up each one of you is to love his wife as himself and the wife to respect her husband. And again, that was the fifth chapter of Ephesians chapters 20 verses 21 through 33 and let's not just be hearers of the word but doers of the word so we're going to continue with prayer and why is prayer so important pray because jesus knows what life is like you can't bring anything to jesus that will shock him nothing you face is surprising to jesus you don't need to hide anything from him think about the humanity of jesus he worked in a shop. He grieved. He saw darkness unleashed like no one else. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And that came from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. All right, let's bow our heads in prayer. Um, dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Lord... Um, I know today that uh, there is nothing that I do that is unseen, Lord. And in prayer, Lord, I repent to you, Lord. Lord, I'm just thankful um, for the opportunity to pray for you, Lord. Lord, uh, I think one of the neatest prayers, Lord, is when we fall in silence, Lord, and the Holy Spirit intervenes, Lord, and we have this movie going on in our head, Lord, of, of our sins and of the people we need to pray for and to love for you, Lord, and we don't even have to speak a word, Lord that you intercede for us, Lord, and you take that to the Father, Lord. Lord, I just bless this church. I bless all the visions that are coming about, Lord. I pray that this church embraces what you have for us, Lord, that we have the opportunity to grow outside of these walls, Lord, to bring people in, to make disciples, Lord. That's what this church is about, Lord. So, Lord, I'm just excited to stand here today knowing 
the visions you have presented to us, Lord, knowing the ministries that you have presented to us, Lord, and that we all get to be a small part of something so big, Lord, and that is building your kingdom, Lord. And Lord, I just want to thank you for this day. Lord, I'm excited to hear the word that you're bringing today, the devotion that you're bringing today, Lord, that it will leave us full yet hungry for your word, Lord. And I say this in your most heavenly name. Amen. My devotional today comes from Romans chapter 12, the 9th through the 13th verse. And they read, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. You know, this past uh, Friday, as, as we always say, I was doing a little bit of channel surfing and came across uh, Joyce Meyer's uh, program. And uh, she was commenting on something I thought uh, held true for most of us, if not all of us. She uh, was talking about how you're at home that Sunday morning before uh, you're, uh, you're coming to church, and there you are arguing with your other half. You leave the house, you're still arguing. You get to the church, and you're steadily arguing as you get out the car. And then you see some other Christians, and all of a sudden, the switch is flipped. How you doing today? Praise God. Good to see you. You go into the church to grab your seat, and there better not be anyone sitting in it either. <laughs> now, the song comes up on the screen, and you're singing the words. And it's like you really mean it. At the same time you're singing that song, your mind's saying, wait till we get out of here. If they think I'm taking them to lunch, they're out of their mind. Are you really giving God all the things he asked for? Now that's why I call this devotional, Can We Talk? Just like Joan Rivers used to say, can we talk? <laughs> Let's start with being sincere. Now, that first verse, you take 1 Timothy, 1 chapter 5th verse, it says, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere face. I guess that means you weren't following through with, with hating what is evil and clinging to what is good when you got out of that car arguing still. It says in Hebrews 13, chapter 1st verse, Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters, which leads into Philippians second chapter. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. All right. Now, how many times has that crossed your mind? I know we sometimes forget those words and we forget who we belong to. We then see uh, in verse 11 that it says we are to honor one another above yourself. We can see that going on by the conversation, but going, going to church. Doesn't seem to follow Acts 8, chapter 18, 25. It says, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew of the baptism of John. Now me, I said, there's another one of them 75 cent words, fervor. I had to look it up just to make sure I was right on what it meant. And in case you didn't know, like I wasn't sure, means great warmth and intensity of emotion or a passionate enthusiasm for some cause. Hmm, what cause were you doing getting out that car? Now, verse 12 has three things that stood out to me. And that was hope, patience, and faithfulness. Now, Romans 5th chapter, 2nd verse, it reminds us that through him we have gained access by faith in his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Remind us that you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And that's from Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Finally, share with the Lord's people. Make, makes me think of what is said in 1 Timothy, 3rd chapter, 
The second verse, the overseer is to be faithful upon, upon reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. You have to remember, lessons aren't always words we speak, but the way we act and do. Right. Now, here you are arguing, what if you got your kids in the car? What do you think they're learning? Well, he already accepted our sins, talking about Jesus. So how come we can't act like him? How come you can't be understanding and forgiving? If he could go to the cross for our sins, how come you can't take and accept your spouse for who they are? If Jesus could accept the punishment for all, can't we act and do things in a godly manner so that the lessons we teach can be repeated by those who watch us? It might be your neighbor, it might be your kids. I don't know. But be sincere, quit hating, stay devoted, honor all. There is hope for all and be patient with others and be faithful to those less fortunate and share what you have with others. I said share, I didn't say give it all away now. Now, each of us have to remember to, that uh, a heartfelt need to be honored and respected. All too often, we take our spouses or our girlfriends or even our kids for granted, and we don't honor them in a manner that we should. I just bring you this today to remind you that just as Jesus loved us, we should love them and be understanding and forgiving. Can we pray? Lord, I've come here today to spread the word for you. Lord, I pray that someone heard what you had me say and will understand and change in the manner that they, they go and, and treat others. Lord, as Pastor Williams comes here to give the message that you have given him, I also pray that it will be heard and understood in the manner that you have decided and all will learn. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. want to say... Um, this that the scripture that was read earlier the Ephesians passage was written at the same time about that this Colossians passage was written when Paul wrote it to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5 he was writing it from the perspective of Jesus relationship with the church but here in Colossians, the relationship is the home, the husband and wife and children in the home. The scripture reads this way, Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, Love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. We're going to stop there. Uh, in those days, the household included household servants. Uh, we don't have that today, so I'm not going to talk about that, okay? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and your brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, the man who seldom finds himself in hot water, seldom finds himself in hot water, is the one with a wife, several daughters, and one bathroom. With that, we want to talk about the home, the family, this morning. When we get to verse 18 of the third chapter in Colossians, Paul has been talking to believers about living a holy life. He calls it in verse 1, seeking the things that are above. In verse 12 through 17, that idea 
is expressed in that we ought to be motivated as Christians, as, as individuals who claim the name of Christ, we ought to be motivated by the grace of Christ, the peace of Christ, the word of Christ, <laughs> and the name of Christ. That, that's what 12 through 17 lays out for us. Uh, seeking the things above is not some escapist practice. Uh, it's not where we meditate in a cave or go and hide out by ourselves, but rather it's the active changing of our spiritual clothes. It's stripping off the old fleshly man with its evil ways, its excess greed and lying, and it's getting dressed in the new spiritual man, Christ, with his rich threads of patience, compassion, and most of all, love. And Paul completes our new wardrobe by calling us to do everything. He says, whatsoever you do, do it with gratitude to God. Be thankful for what God has provided you. Now, 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 faith in Christ not only changes individuals, it can't help then but to change the home. It can't help but to change families. So Paul transitions in verse 18 from in, addressing individual believers to now addressing believers about their home life. We understand the importance, the value of home and family, don't we? We understand that, don't we? The first institution God placed on earth was the home, amen? Genesis 2, 18 through 25, God establishes the home. And we all know as the home goes, so goes the nation, so goes society. Uh, I don't quote him often, but Confucius has a quote that helps us here. Uh, he says, the strength of a nation is derived from the strength of its homes. Y'all, you can say amen when I say Family life is not what it used to be. Two-parent households are on the decline in the United States as divorce, remarriage, and cohabitation are on the rise. Isn't that right? Now, y'all, I'm not picking at nobody this morning, all right? I'm just telling you what the word says, all right? Uh, uh, the increase in single parent families and the changes to two parent families both have an impact. While in the early 1960s, baby was typically born to married mothers. Y'all today, fully four in 10 children are typically born to marry, uh, unmarried mothers or mothers who are living with a partner to whom they are not married. In 1960, 73% of, of all children were living uh, in a family with two married parents in their first marriage. And today, less than 46% of kids are living in that situation. Today, 62% of children live in a home where they have two married parents. And y'all, that's an all-time low, 62%. And the decline in children living in two-parent families has been offset by an almost three-fold increase in those living with just one parent, typically their mother. These statistics come from a Pew Research report. I should have told you that. Um, the percentage of children living with one parent is at 26%, up from 22% in 2000, and it was just 9% in 1960. Wow. Couples unmarried, cohabiting, both parents having to work, marriage divorced, at record rates, children receiving less and less of that good old fashioned home training. I'm just simply saying we all know 
Life in families in America is not what it used to be and not at all what God wants it to be. And we know if any group of people should be getting home life right, it's we who profess faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, we're not surprised when unsaved, non-Bible readers have breakdowns in their home life. Uh, it's not surprised when they have situations that lead to these statistics, but as his children who have access to his word, we must glean from its truths to do home life, amen, according to God's word. I'm saying these numbers wouldn't be that way if more folks were doing it God's way. Somebody say amen. amen. And I'm saying we must, amen, model and teach Biblical truth, biblical home life to our kids. So to that end, our focus this month is on marriage and the family. That's our focus this month. Pastor Norville spoke on it last week, and I'm picking it up this morning. And our subject today simply is the Christian home. In this passage, Paul addresses the various family members, husbands, wives, and children in order to stress the qualities and behaviors required to have a godly Christian home. We want all of them to be godly and Christian, don't we? Paul's laying out here what it takes, all right? And, and, and I want to say he begins addressing couples and he starts with the wife, okay? And, and I want to just point out, he doesn't start with the wife because she needs the most help. You know, he doesn't start with the wife because, you know, she, she, she's the one who causes the... No, 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 no. Likely he starts with the wife because Jesus elevated the status of women and he puts her first. That makes sense? Hmm. Verse 18... He says, wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Hmm. Not to every man, sisters, wives, not to every man, but to your own husband. Isn't that right? <laughs> now, this word for submit is a military term, meaning to put oneself in rank under another. It's like the colonel and the sergeant, you know? It's submitting to God's plan by putting yourself under subjection to authority. And, and I wanna say, this isn't anything strange. This isn't anything out of the ordinary. God has ordained the principle of authority and submission in lots of areas of life. In Romans 13:1. Uh, we citizens are supposed to be subject to governmental authorities. Hmm. In, in Titus 2.9, workers are supposed to be uh, submitted to their employers. In Hebrews 13.17, church members are to submit to church leaders. In Colossians 3.20, children are supposed to submit to parents. We're going to talk about that. As well as in 1 Peter 3.1, as well as in Colossians 3.18, he says, wives, submit to your husbands. Sharing this principle is an important fact. God commands wives to be in subjection to their husband, and it doesn't mean the husband is better or more important than his wife. It doesn't mean that a husband has a biblical right to boss, to voice demands, to make decisions affecting the family without including the wife. It's not a license for the husband to always get his way, to always do as he pleases, when he pleases. Look, we don't like the idea of submitting, do we? <laughs> especially a wife to her husband. I, I remember counseling a couple. They were getting ready to get married. And this young lady had a situation where her mother pretty well ran the family. And she was looking forward to doing the same thing. And when we got to this part in the marriage counseling, 
Woo! <laughs> she just broke down. <laughs> First she got angry and then she just cried. So, so, so why does God lay out this hard, controversial, yet unmistakable requirement in his word? And he lays it out more than once. Well, I want you to see, it should be a, will, a, a, a woman's willing, voluntary response to God's will to give up her individual rights to the God-ordained authority of the husband. Huh? Not the husband's ordained authority, right? But God's ordained. God set that aside that way. Huh? And so what I'm saying is, it's not just a subjection, but it's a willing subjection in the text. The, the, the grammar says it's willing that she submits. So we want to find out why, right? And the first thing I want to say here is because of God's order. We all know God is a God of order, amen? Amen. He does all things, y'all finish it, decently and amen. Recall what Pastor Norville told us from the sermon last week. The man was alone, right? He was incomplete. There was no one comparable to him when God had him name all the animals, right? And so God brought him a completer from out of his own flesh, didn't he? He brought him someone to complete him, someone to help him, since he was the leader. And, and I encourage you to read 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 13 there, because it says it directly, okay? So, 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 so I'm simply saying to us, it's important that we understand this submission thing is part of God's order. What do we always say? Too many chiefs? <laughs> Amen? You, everybody can't lead, huh? God's design is for the man to lead and for the woman to help. Somebody say amen. amen. Hmm. Now, that's important because this helps us to see the woman submitting works to accomplish God's plan. God put them together for a reason. You, don't you know, y'all didn't come together by accident? Y'all didn't come together by chance? God has a plan. The man's supposed to be executing, amen, and you came along, sister, to help. God gave us a purpose. And we all need to do our part, amen? amen? It was getting roles reversed in dealing with the serpent that caused too much humanity so much problem in the first place. They got out of their roles, both of them. So first of all, God has an order, and it's because of the order. That wives submit. Second, it's God's decree. God's order, God's decree. The decree is a result from the fall. You recall in Genesis 3.16, there were two consequences of the fall for the woman. The first one was, God told her, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. That, that's a result of the fall. Right? But then secondly, in that same verse, he says, and your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. That means her resolve and willpower would be yielded to that of her husband. Her place in the relationship would be one of subordination. Her husband would rule in the sense of having headship, again, being the leader. That's all it means. 
So God's order, God's decree, and then God's wisdom. My brothers and sisters, whenever God grants authority, it's never to do harm. It's always for the blessing and protection of the ones under authority. That's the problem with police going off shooting folks. Because they're supposed to, what? Serve and defend or defend and protect or whatever it is. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. My brother and sister, God never is giving an advantage to the ones in authority. God loves us and in his wisdom, he has ordained proper authority for the benefit of each of us. To be in authority doesn't mean you got greater perks, but instead greater responsibility and greater accountability before God. The reason it may not look that way is because authority, like many other things, has been perverted and twisted in this fallen world. Folks take advantage of their position, don't they? So, so my brothers and sisters, I need to move on, but let me just say submission is an evidence of respect. When you get home, I want you to read Matthew 5, 33. It was read today in 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2. They are passages where wives are also told to submit. And, and, and I want you to see there, a wife is never told, believe it or not, to love her husband. What she's told is not only to submit, but to show him respect. Brothers, y'all say amen if what I'm about to say is right. No respect like that of the woman you love can build and strengthen you more. No, there's nothing to us like your respect for us. You hear what I'm saying? Your respect will build us down, up, excuse me, and your disrespect will tear us down. You have that power. Now, brothers and sisters, the idea of submission is a key reason why we must teach our young girls to continually ask themselves when they're interested in a guy, is this someone I can submit to? Amen. Submission is mandatory, y'all. There's going to be consequences if you're not submitting. So don't get with somebody that you can't submit to. Submission is also a practical reason young people must resist the temptations to have sexual relations with the first person that tells them how good they look. Y'all, it's not only wrong because the Bible says it's wrong, it's re wrong because it's only an imitation of the relationship God has planned for you. That you're jumping ahead, huh? You're getting things out of order. And you're hurting yourself. So I just want to say this. Yes, in 2021, submission is valid. It's valid for all times and cultures because the text says it's fitting, it's proper, it's orderly in the Lord. But it, he didn't stop <laughs> with one person in the couple. He moved on to the husband in verse 19. <laughs> and, and, and husbands in verse 19 are given two commands Re regarding their behavior and their attitude toward their wives. They're told, love their wives, and sort of an opposite to that is not be bitter towards your, your wives. It says, love them, brothers, 
And the word love here is not that romantic, amorous, passionate kind of love. It's not that uh, 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 Greek erotic kind of love we view in the movies or we hear the rappers <laughs> talk about in the latest hip hop tunes. It's, it's not that emotion that drives us to do those silly things. But the word is actually a word that means to take pleasure in her, to appreciate her for who she is. You're not trying to make her somebody else, amen? amen. You see her and appreciate her for who she is. Now, 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 now certainly affection is part of this, uh, but it's also uh, a sympathetic a uh, selfless love that always seeks her best. This love means that in exercising his headship, the husband works to accomplish the highest good for his wife. Even if he feels like it's not the highest good for him. Now I'm going to mess with you because brothers, ultimately is going to be the highest good for you because two become one. And what's good for her is ultimately good for you. <laughs> the word used here is a form of that highest kind of love called agape. It's the same selfless, sacrificial, serving love with which Christ loves us. So much so, you know Ephesians says it, that he gave his life for us even though we didn't deserve it. This love is not so much about feelings, it's about commitment. The first is to God and his truth. And because you're committed to God and his truth, you're committed, amen, to your wife. Because that's what God wants you to be, amen? Listen, a man may court a woman based on normal romantic love, but in marriage, it must progress into this deeper, more spiritual love that only comes from God. If that doesn't happen, there are going to be problems in the marriage. And based on Ephesians 5, 21, 25 and following, the emphasis for the man is not his authority, but his duty to submit to his wife through this self-giving for her. Just as the wife's submission is to be willing, the husband is commanded here to willingly love his wife. It should follow from his love for and obedience to God. I'm just saying if we're wearing the grace clothes, the earlier part of Colossians talks about if a husband's heart is filled with peace and the word of Christ, then his contribution to the home will be joy and harmony, and your marriage has a better chance of being strong. But there's a second command he gives the man here. He says, don't be bitter toward your wife. So, so, so why this command about not being bitter? Paul didn't mention this in the Ephesians account. The word for bitter here is to grow angry, to become cold and, and irritated toward a person. I believe Paul gives this warning because it's so easy to become bitter or, and resentful, not just because of something your wife said or did or didn't do, but also because of the challenges and responsibilities marriage brings to the one who's in the position of headship. I remember seeing my father come home sometimes when we were all teenagers. We, there were four boys in my family and he had to feed us all. <laughs> and I remember seeing, seeing him come home sometimes. He was frustrated because it was hard to make them ends meet. It's enough to make you bitter. But executing godly love isn't easy. It's not a cakewalk. Husbands must be careful not to allow a root of bitterness to invade the home and sprout into Satan's poison that hinders the marriage. I submit, 
Verses like Ephesians 4.15, which encourage us to speak the truth in love. And verses like Ephesians 4.26, which warns us not to allow the sun to go down on our wrath, are priceless tools for addressing our frustrations. Don't let it build up. Talk about it. Amen? Express yourself. Let your baby rub you a little bit and soothe you a little bit. Amen? Amen. Y'all, bitterness describes an emotion. It, it, it's an emotion that builds up, that grows. And emotions impact relationships. What we want is intimacy. A feeling of closeness, amen? A feeling of being able to share whatever we need to share. But bitterness results in a feeling of distance and alienation. That's not what God called us to. If a husband allows himself to be moody, upset, lets bitterness toward his wife fester, he's setting a, ne a, a, a negative emotional climate in his home. I'm just saying we have to deal with it. We have to deal with it. Further, a husband who loves his wife will not act harshly or become overbearing or dictatorial around the house. He will seek and value her input. He will seek to live out Paul's teaching on love. Remember this? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. Doesn't boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. I'm just saying, husbands, don't allow yourselves to become bitter. Love your wives. And let me say this, sisters, now y'all can say amen. A wife <laughs> really has no trouble submitting to a husband who she knows loves her like this. <laughs> so he talks to the couple, and then he talks to the children. In order to have a Christian home, children must be obedient to their parents. In verse 20, we have a command to obey, and then the reason why. Y'all, we know that word obey. It's to listen attentively, to, to respond with full compliance. It's, it's yielding to the authority of that person that's giving the instruction. Now, according to Genesis 2, you have a family when the male and female marry. That's a family. But the family is enhanced. The family grows through the addition of children. And notice the children are commanded to obey their parents in what? What's the text say? In everything. <laughs> he said, in everything. That means children don't get to choose the things that they're going to obey. And that means we ought not let them choose. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen. Now, now, now th th there is one caveat in Ephesians 6. The limit to this everything, a child doesn't have to obey when what the parent is demanding of them goes against God's word. Huh? So we need to be sure what, we, what we're doing, and I know we understand. But, but, but. Too often, we just kind of let them do what they want to do, somebody. Now, just check out the seriousness of this, this thing. Uh, likely, what I'm about to say is referring to older children, okay? It's referring to older children, not to little ones, but disobedience to parents is designated as rebellion against God himself in the Old Testament. It's not just against the parents, it's first against God. Because again, God has established this order. When you get out of the order, amen, you're rebelling against God. So 
check out the severity of the punishment for disobedient to parents. Proverbs 30, verse 17, the eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. I think that speaks. Deuteronomy 21, verse 18, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they dis discipline him, he still won't listen to them, Verse 21 concludes this way, then all the men of his town are to stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you. All Israel will hear of it and be afraid. Is that speak to us today? Look, disobedient, disrespectful children were a blight on the community and a danger to the nation. I'm not pointing blame because there's a lot of reasons we have going on in our community what's going on right now. But I want to say, amen, is, is, is not pleasing to God. And, and, and we parents, we adults, we have an obligation to these babies. We have to teach them to obey. Unfortunately, our society is functioning like an MMA fighter who has one hand tied to a foot. You know, can't fight too well when it's tied up like that, amen? <laughs> I mean, uh, things are out of balance. Parents can't hardly chastise and correct their children for psychologists and courts interfering. I'll never forget, I have a cousin, his father, my uncle spanked him. He was sniffling, you know, and I'm going to call the, the law on you. You just child abused me. <laughs> his daddy told him, go ahead and call him, and then I'm going to spank you again. <laughs> we just have to embrace the fact that all children all of us are born in sin. Amen? I mean, all of us are impacted by Adam's decision. Where we're all in his gene pool and we're all impacted. And so they need the direction that we can give. And then this, the, the text tells why. It says a child's obedience is well pleasing to the Lord. It reflects God's design for order in the home. It is right and proper in God's eyes. And because this is the first commandment given with a promise, it suggests the obedient, dutiful child will be blessed and will prosper. So finally, this text speaks to men in their role as fathers in verse 21. To assure a godly home, it says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Now, I forgot to tell y'all this earlier, but all of these are commands. Every one of them in the original language, it's, it's a command. And so he's saying, I command you not to irritate not to stir up, not to arouse anger in your child. When I read it, it makes me think about teasing and picking at a person until they become so angry they can't help but to react. Y'all, with fathers, the issue could be teasing or picking, but more the tendency is to, to make inconsistent, trivial, or excessive demands. You know, kids need structure, they need consistency. We need to do it the same way, amen? Need to go to bed about the same time every night, amen? They need that consistency. It, 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 it's a father being unreasonable, humiliating, or, or cruel to the child. It can all, also happen through showing favoritism or un, indifference. They, they pick that up real fast, amen? Uh, this behavior only causes the child to become discouraged. Children especially need praise from dad for doing well. 
And, and I believe as, as adults in their lives, as parents, we need to work at, work at catching them doing something right so we can pat them on the back. They don't need constant criticism. They need to be lifted up. And, 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 and in, in addition to that, they especially need parents to take time with them, to spend time with them. I was reading something this week in preparation. Uh, one guy, uh, you know, was he's trying to provide. He's working. He's working. He's spending, believe it or not, 37 seconds with his young son a day during the week, five days a week. Look, they need focused attention, eye contact, and appropriate touch regularly. Huh? Focused attention, eye contact. Listen, they need us to listen to them. Huh? To us, it's not so important. <laughs> but to them, it's really important. We need to hear them. When they ask us for something, we don't need to just say no right away. <laughs> Give it some consideration, amen? Maybe it's a no. But, but think about it. Don't just say no, you know, because you're bothering me, you know. Time for me to sit down. Um, I... Uh, I think it's important for us to see this passage in, 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 in Colossians. I mean, he's saying to the family, this is what you need to do. You want to be ha happy? You want to be godly? This, this is it. The challenge for busy, sometimes overworked and tired parents <laughs> is to treat their kids with less tenderness and loving kindness than they ordinarily would. So the kids lose heart and become discouraged or unmotivated. Their spirits become broken. But we want to be like Jesus, amen? <laughs> and, and, and that's why Jesus treated us with tender, loving kindness, didn't he? I mean, nowhere is that better illustrated in the fact that he became one of us, amen? Nowhere is that better illustrated in the fact that he was tempted in all ways like as we are. He went through everything that we go through. He, he knows what we struggle with. He knows the struggles we face. So knowing our plight, got to close with this, knowing our plight, he took abuse for us, didn't he? Knowing our plight, he allowed himself to be beaten for us, didn't he? Knowing our plight, he died for us. He gave his life so that you and I might have an opportunity to understand that believing in his death on our behalf, we have a right to become part of his family. That's the old story. That's the good news. Good news makes for a happy family, amen? <laughs> I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We celebrate what God has done, what God has ordained, what God has put in place, what God has ordered. And it all begins. We can't be part of a Christian family if we haven't surrendered to Christ. We just told the old, old story. Jesus came because man was lost. Jesus came because God promised he was going to come. He lived life experiencing all that we experience. And then he allowed himself to die because only his sinless blood could pay the price for our sin. You hear me, you're under the sound of my voice, you know that you're a sinner, 
that you haven't confessed that sin, you haven't asked forgiveness for that sin, you can do that right now. We invite you to recognize that God wants you to be part of his family. He wants to give you eternal life in his presence. All you have to do is simply submit and acknowledge that I've fallen, I've failed, I've fallen short. For those of you who are with us virtually this morning, you can see the number on the screen. We invite you to call. Let us know that you've surrendered your life to Christ. Jesus died, but he rose again, proving that if we put our trust in him, eternal life is ours. Right now, I invite you to put your trust, trust for your eternal being in his hands. Won't you submit? Won't you surrender to Christ? For returning to his Father in heaven, Jesus commissioned his followers to go and make disciples. Becoming a disciple begins with a confession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is step one. Step two is to join a local church such as Mount Moriah and continues with a lifetime of growth in faith and fruitfulness. Call one of our pastors or connection counselors today to join this journey of discipleship. We experience the power of prayer daily at Mount Moriah. Also, our pastors post a prayer on our YouTube and Facebook pages each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings. We are also commanded to study God's Word because it teaches us what is true, corrects us when we are wrong, and teaches us to do what is right. The continuation of this church's ministry would not be possible without your prayers and your financial support. Thank you so much for your generosity. Remember to view and subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook channels there as well as on our church website www.mountmariahomaha.net you will find sermons, pastoral prayers, and more information to help you know us and to know the Lord. Finally, we thank you for worshiping with us today and pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, that the Lord will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, that the Lord will turn his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.